Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. Be unique, be essential, be relevant. Don't just be, be unique. Matter where you are. Don't just be furniture. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the last in this series on toxic personalities in the real world. This may be the most important conversation we have had all year. That's a big statement, so I'm putting some pressure on myself that we've got to pay off here. Now, I'm not going to waste any time reviewing what we've been talking about in this series because we've been talking about those, and I want to spend it preparing for what I'm recommending you do as a strategy, because what I'm going to ask you to do, I want it to stick. And that means lifestyle change. It doesn't mean that you make some emotionally driven promise to yourself, because look, willpower is a myth. If you make some commitment to yourself and it's based on willpower, because you're all fired up, you're all emotional and It's a new year, and I'm going to get out there, and I'm going to do it. Anybody can do it when you're all fired up. The question is, can you do it when you're not all fired up? And how do you do that when you're not all fired up? Well, you do it because you have your world programmed to support you, to carry you along. Now, here's what I want to do. Let's just jump in, and I'm going to tell you, I want to talk about your thinking. I want to talk about your relationships. I want to talk about your habits. And I want to talk about you being who you are and doing it on purpose. Think about that, because when we get to it, it's going to be a big deal. I want you to be you on purpose, not you reactively being who you are on purpose. You choose to be who you are. You choose to be how you are. You choose the personality you exhibit. You choose the behaviors you show. You choose the attitude you have. You don't react to the world. You're not in a bad mood because the world was irritating. You choose your mood, whether the world's irritating or whether it's not. I want you to be who you are on purpose. Let's think about that. Last week, we talked about you need to decide who you are. You remember, we said in borderline personality, you sometimes hear these people just with their head in their hands saying, oh, I don't even know who I am anymore. This is the antithesis of that. This is exactly the opposite. They sit there and say, I don't even know who I am anymore. I want you saying, I know exactly who I am. And here's where it starts. Let's talk about your thinking. Now, I told you in a tease at the end of our conversation last week, that I was going to tell you something this week that could improve your efficiency as much as 40%. You're going to hear what I'm getting ready to say and go, oh, no, that's not true. And I'm going to tell you why you're going to say that before you say it. You're going to say it because it doesn't have what we call face validity. And let me tell you what I mean by face validity. Something lacks face validity if when you look at it, it's not fancy enough where it makes sense, and you go, okay, I can see how that would work. And one of the biggest things in the field of psychology that has one of the most profound effects on your overall health and well-being mentally, emotionally, and physically is relaxation. Relaxation, learning how to really relax. And you know why people don't do it more? Is because it doesn't have face validity. They say, no, 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 Doc, I need something fancier than that. I'm not going to come in here and go through a session with you and pay you 300 bucks or whatever it is you charge 
for you to tell me I need to relax. I mean, hell, I knew that before I got here. Give me something real. Give me some therapy. You know, tell me something fancy. Don't tell me I need to relax. Hell, my mother told me I need to relax. It doesn't have face validity, so people throw it out. But the fact of the matter is, when I talk about relaxation, I'm talking about dissipating muscular tension at a level you've never done it before, clearing your mind, dissipating all the tension throughout your body, getting into a meditative state that you don't even know exists, and it is not easy to do, and it takes skill to get there. But it doesn't have face validity, so most people poo-poo it. And what I'm getting ready to tell you is the same way. It doesn't have face validity, so it's real easy to say, oh, no. So what is it I'm talking about? I'm talking about this. If you will discipline yourself to stop multitasking, you can increase your cognitive and mental efficiency as much as 40%. Because research has shown us time and time and time again, year after year after year after year, with population after population, and different age group after different age group, that multitasking doesn't work. And there are less than two and a half percent of people in the world who can successfully multitask. And let me just tell you, you need to assume you ain't one of those 2.5%. Because I'm willing to bet all I can gather that you're not. Those are what we call in the profession super taskers. And they're very uncommon. They have unique cognitive characteristics. They're unbelievably cognitively agile. They're able to activate one part of their brain and then another very, very quickly and get up to speed very, very quickly in that part of their brain because different tasks use different parts of the brain. You need to assume that ain't you. It ain't me. And I'm betting it's not you. So you think you can keep a lot of balls in the air. You're wrong. You are not efficient when you do that, and you can increase your efficiency If you will do one thing at a time, get it done, and move on. And that means turn off the television, stop doing something else while you're doing something else, get one thing done at a time, and move on to the next thing. You will be surprised how much extra time you have. Now, let me tell you what people miss when they think they're doing what I just said. Because I've had people tell me, okay, Doc, I listen to you. I quit multitasking. I turned off the stereo. I turned off the television. I got the kids out of the room. I stopped multitasking. No, you didn't. You stopped external distractions, but you didn't unclutter your mind. You kept thinking about five different things at one time. You were running a track in your mind. You were thinking about one thing while you were working on something else. You just got rid of the external distractions. It's just like people thinking relaxation is easy. You think multitasking, stopping it is easy. It's not. You have to develop the skills of concentration, shutting out the noise on the inside, uncluttering your brain. It all begins and ends in your mind, and what you give power to has power over you. What you give power to has power over you. And how do you give power to something? You pay attention to it. You let it run in your mind. Let me give you an example. I have talked to so many women that are struggling with eating disorders, anorexia and bulimia, and I trace it back to when they were in middle school and they're walking through the lunchroom and some bully says, hey, fatty, does some kind of body shaming with them. That sticks in their mind. 
And the bully might have said it once or maybe twice, but then they take over for the bully and they repeat it 10,000 times. It's just running in their head. So I want to talk to you about guilt, grudges, and go-tos. Feeling guilty? You may think that feeling guilty about something is a redeeming quality. All feeling guilty does is make you a really crummy partner. You may think, well, I haven't been a very good husband, and I just feel terrible about that. Well, if you really feel terrible about it, then don't sit around moping as a guilty husband. Forgive yourself, apologize, and get off your lazy butt and go be a good partner. Guilt is like rocking in a chair. It's something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. All it does is make you poor company. So you feel guilty, so you're going to punish your partner by being poor company? That doesn't do anything except punish your partner worse. Grudges. Somebody's wronged you in some way, so you carry a grudge. Carrying a grudge is like letting somebody live in your brain rent-free. They take up space in your brain. They've wronged you in some way, so now you're going to let them move into your head and occupy it for the rest of your life? Are you kidding me? And these go-tos, we all have certain things that when we get down on ourselves, we go to. These are what I call the go-tos. We just start beating ourselves up, doubting ourselves, judging ourselves, putting ourselves down. I'm Katie Maloney, 37, a divorcee, and I'm out here falling in love every day with myself. And I'm Dana Kathan, 33, former needy mess and delusional Leo, but I've never been happier. Never been happier. You know that. Good. <laughs> the foundation of this podcast is for people who want to live their life unapologetically. It's a safe space for anyone who's going through a transition in their life or just dealing with the regular bullshit. It's a religion. We're not saying that we're looking to start a coven, but that might be why we started but this we're podcast. Not, not Stop saying that. Join our cult. I mean, community. I mean, the coven. Religion. Okay, let's just stick with community. Listen to the podcast. Listen to the podcast. <laughs> Hi, this is Rachel Yucatel, and I'm here to invite you to listen to my podcast, Misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. This podcast delves into the lives of those who have been reduced to a single headline. Each episode will take a closer look at the stories of those who are on a mission to change their narrative. Join me as we uncover the truth behind the misconceptions, shed light on the stories of those who have perhaps been wrongfully portrayed, explore the complexities of the human experience, and celebrate the power of second chances. Who doesn't love a good comeback story? You need to decide what those things are. When you're really beating yourself up, what is it you say the most? Write those things down. And when you hear yourself doing it, you need to put up the stop sign and say, whoa, I agreed I'm not going to do this anymore. Those are the things you've got to get rid of if you really want to stop multitasking. It isn't just turning off the television or taking the earbuds out so you're not listening to music while you're trying to read a book. It's not just that. It comes from the inside out, too. So you've got to get the mind clutter cleaned up. Go look in your garage, and if you've got one of these garages where you open the door and you can't even get in, is your mind like that? And how does it feel if you ever clean that garage up where you can now pull a car in there? You can see the floor. It's organized. It's clean. You got rid of all of that junk. How does it feel? when you organize a chaotic room, doesn't it feel <sighs> fresh and revitalized? You go, wow. It's like painting a black wall white or a white wall black. You can really see the progress. And you go, look, I, I, I did that. It's the same way when you clean up a messy room or weed a garden that's just been overcome with weeds. When you get all cleaned out and it's all fresh dirt, you go, wow. It was such a mess before, and look how neat it is now. Think about your mind that way. Get all the clutter out of your mind. It's like, 
you know, empty it out one ear. Get all of that out of your mind. Empty it out. Give yourself permission. You know, that bully talks 120 words a minute. You think 12 to 1,400 words a minute. So they might say it once, and you repeat it 10x. They talk 120 words a minute. You think 10 times as fast. Think how many times you can repeat that in a day, a month, a year. It becomes automatic, what we call automatic thoughts. You don't even articulate every word anymore. You've condensed it and collapsed it so much that it's just automatic. It's just instantaneous. You've got to stop that because for every thought you have, there's a physiological correlate that goes with it. Depressed people have a different physiology than people that are not depressed. Anxious people have a different physiology than people that aren't anxious. So you say, well, I just think it. I don't do anything about it. Yes, you do. When you think it, you're doing something about it. Your body is changing. How do you think people get ulcers? Do you think calm people get ulcers? That's not how it works. There's physiological elements that go with every thought you have. So you've got to unclutter your mind. And that's why I said I wanted you to show up today with a pen and a pad. I want you to write down. You've got to make a list. That's how you get things out of your head. You get them out of your head if you put them on a piece of paper. You put them on a list. Then you think, okay, I don't need to remember them because I wrote them down right here, and I can fold this up and put it in the drawer. I can put it in my pocket. I can put it in the drawer. I don't need to remember it because I have it written down. I don't need to keep going over it in my mind. I have it on a list. And when I resolve it, I can cross it off the list. If you wake up in the middle of the night and you're thinking about it, put it on your list. Get it out of your head by putting it on the list. It doesn't do any good to just think about it. Put it on the list. You need to have a shit list of all the crap in your head. Just put it on the list. And when you put it on the list, you get it out of your head. Give yourself permission. And one of the things that you may need to do if you are having trouble achieving what I'm asking you to do is designate a time during the day where you're going to think about all this clutter in your head. So, okay, I pick the kids up from school at 4.30 or 3.30, or I get off work at the bank at 5. I'm going to close my office door and spend from 5 to 5.30. I'm going to devote it to my list. I'm going to spend that time worrying about everything that clutters up my mind. If that helps you to designate a time that I'm going to think about this stuff during that time, but no other time. That's my designated time to think about, worry about, fret about, obsess about, ruminate about, whatever you want to call it. If you need to designate a time to do that, then do it. But outside of that time, you do not permit yourself to go down that rabbit hole. You have to unclutter your mind. We are not going to get efficient. I said you can improve your efficiency 40% if you stop multitasking. It's more than turning off the TV. You've got to get this out of here. This is like elevator music. You don't really hear it until I say, okay, let's listen to you. You know, one of the things that is done with this, there's something called dialectical behavior therapy. One of the things they do is they try to get people to listen to their internal dialogue, and to the extent it's negative and self-defeating, they try to get them to change that. But they do one of the other things. Dr. Linehan came up with this. And I was so impressed with what she did here, because one of the things she did was to increase the client's distress tolerance. She said, look, everything's not going to get resolved in your life. You may have a sister that is just a troublemaker, and that may not get any better. So we want to increase your ability to tolerate certain things where they don't trigger you. We increase your distress tolerance. So putting all these things on the list doesn't mean they're going to all be resolved. It just means they're out of your head where you don't ruminate about them. That means just over and over and over thinking about them. So number one, we want to unclutter your mind. You can't stop multitasking and get this increased 
cognitive, mental efficiency unless you unclutter your mind. So let's unclutter the mind. That means you got to say something about art. What is it I think about? What is it that haunts me? What do I go over and over and over in my head? I'm going to write it down. It gives you some objectivity from it. And as I said, if you need to designate time, designate a time. But let's clean up your mind. Don't get caught in this guilt trap. Don't get caught carrying grudges. And don't get caught with the go-tos. Just doing what you always do because it's what you've always done. Don't do that. You can't change what you don't acknowledge. I always put this on myself. Well, then stop doing that. Acknowledge it and change it. Now, relationships. I said we're going to talk about your thinking and that we're going to talk about your relationships. I've been talking to you about boundaries, right? Social circle cleanup. Here's a good rule. Stop needing people that don't need you. You notice I paused for a minute because I want that to sink in. Stop needing people that don't need you. If you've got people in your life that they just don't pay attention to you, they don't value you, they don't treat you with dignity and respect, then you need to get over those people. And you say, well, Dr. Phil, that's easy to say. It's not easy to do. I didn't say it was easy to do. I just said it needs doing. Stop needing people that don't need you. You know, I tell people, Stop chasing the wrong one because the right one won't run. I grew up with three sisters, and you know I was next to the youngest. Even when I was 12 years old, I would see my older sisters, where they'd be chasing after some guy, and I would say, look, that's not who you want. How do you know that? You're 12. Because if he was the right one, he wouldn't be running away from you. The right one won't run. <laughs> Quit chasing him. When he's the right one, they resonate with you. They click with you. They have chemistry, whether it's a friend or a lover. It doesn't matter. People that care about you, that value you, love you, they won't run from you. They will be drawn to you. You will bond. You will share things together. So clean up this social circle you're in. If you've got toxic people in it, clean it up. I'd rather be healthy alone than sick with somebody else, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you rather be healthy alone than in a toxic, sick, pathological, damaging relationship with somebody else? I would. I like me okay. I don't want to be alone, but if I'm going to do it, I'm not a bad person to do it with. Decide that about yourself because you won't be alone. There are people in this world for everybody. And I want you to become a discerning shopper. When it comes to relationships, you need to have some discernment. I'm trying to give you some straight-up rules here. We've all seen the headlines in the news of how someone lost their life in an act of cold-blooded murder. And while it's sad and grabs your attention, most people go on with their day without giving it another thought. But have you ever stopped to think about the life of the person at the center of the news story? They were more than just a headline or a statistic. They were someone's loved one or friend. I'm Mike Morford, and my podcast, The Murder of My Family, dives into some of those stories to help listeners get to know the person who was lost and how their death affected those closest to them. Listen to The Murder of My Family everywhere you listen to podcasts. There are well over 100 episodes to binge on now. There are over 90,000 people missing at any time, and over half a million are reported missing every year. And that's just in the United States. I'm Mike Morford. And I'm Jess Betancourt. And in our podcast, Missing Persons, we discuss cases of people who have gone missing under mysterious circumstances. And we're joined in each episode by guests who are either related to the missing person, investigating their disappearance, or advocating for answers in the case. Missing Persons is available everywhere you listen to podcasts, and there are dozens of episodes to binge on right now. Subscribe today so you don't miss an episode. And here's one of the rules. Have faith in yourself and then trust in those who earn it. Have faith in yourself. That's who you can trust, is you. That's who you can go with just based on faith. Everybody else, they need to earn it. Now, I was raised up in a Baptist church and the Bible Belt and 
we were taught you give people the benefit of the doubt. That's insane. Certainly in this day and time with a transient society where we don't really know people. You know, when I grew up, we weren't a very transient society. You knew everybody in the neighborhood. If anybody that wasn't supposed to be there, they stuck out like a sore thumb. Because we weren't very transient. We went to school two blocks away. Nobody moved. Everybody was there. So if like some stranger, like stranger danger showed up, you knew this guy didn't belong here. Even then, it didn't make sense. Give people benefit of the doubt. Why would you do that? And you're thinking, well, Dr. Phil, that's awful harsh. No, it's not. You shouldn't judge them as bad either. I'm not saying they're guilty till proven innocent. I'm saying what you should do is gather information, gather data until you have enough to make an informed decision. You don't give somebody the benefit of the doubt. You don't let them in your life. You don't loan them money. You don't do all of these things because it's a nice thing to do. Are you kidding me? You need to gather enough data until you can make an informed decision. See them in enough different situations and circumstances. Try a little something and see how it works. And if they show themselves to be trustworthy at that level, then go to the next level. I play tennis a lot, and I have some friends that are tennis friends. And I trust them as tennis friends 100%. And what does that mean? It means if I make a date to play tennis with them, I expect them and trust that they will show up 100% of the time. They will not stand me up. They will not be an hour late. When they get there, they won't be a jerk and argue over line calls and pout if they're losing or slam balls around or whatever. They'll be pleasant and we'll laugh and compete and have a good time. I trust that that's what will happen. But that doesn't mean I take them home. It doesn't mean I go into business with them. It doesn't mean I confide in them family secrets. I trust them 100% at the level of a tennis friend. It doesn't mean that they can't be more than that. They just aren't yet. And maybe they will be. Maybe they won't. And they probably trust me the same way. It's like, you know, he's a good tennis friend. He shows up every time. He's pleasant. He doesn't cheat. He doesn't argue line calls. He plays hard every time. And we laugh and have a good time. And then we get in our cars and leave. That doesn't mean that they can make a decision about my overall morality or my politics or how I would be as a business partner, that's not relevant. If they were going to take it to the next level, they would need to gain more information. Do that. Have friends at a certain level, and then if they ratchet up, you need more information. Don't give people the benefit of the doubt. Some people are loyal to you, and some people are loyal to their need for you. And when the need changes, so does the loyalty. Like they may need you for some work-related reason, and then if they change jobs, you're no longer relevant, and they don't care. They were loyal to their need for you, not to you. Pay attention to people's motive. Why are they doing what they're doing? Pay attention to whether people seem to be entitled or if they're accountable. You want people in your circle who own what they do. They don't sit around asking what you can do for them or what the world can do for them. Decide who you want to populate your space with. Have the courage to cut ties. You know, I said, part of your image is set boundaries. That's why I was talking about that, because now I want you to go, you know what? I've kind of been a passenger in my life. People that are in my life are in my life because they just were there. So since they're there, they just kind of stayed there. No, no, no. We're not going to be that way anymore. We're not going to have people there just because. They're not going to be there today just because they were there yesterday, and they were there yesterday because they were there the day before. They're going to be there today because you choose for them to be there. 
You're going to be you on purpose, and part of that means you're going to choose your friends on purpose. You're going to choose your relationships on purpose. You say, well, I can't choose my mother. I can't choose my dad. No, but you can choose what relationship you have with them. You can choose how much of a part of your life they are. And hear this real clear. You don't have to react every time you can. Now, this doesn't sound like a big one, but this is a big one. You don't have to react every time you have a justifiable reason to be offended. Just because you can be offended doesn't mean you must be offended. And, oh, my God, are we a bunch of offended people in this day and time. Something's offending everybody. You don't have to be offended because you can be. It's okay to let something slide. Pick your battles. Pick your battles. In the last podcast, I was talking about a paralegal. And I said, let me tell you something about this girl. Some people would get offended that I referred to her as a girl instead of a woman. Why well, mean anything by that? It's just I knew her. I worked with her for 20 years. When I first met her, she was 18. She was a girl. I was 20 years older than her. It's just in my mind, I fixed her in that level. And nobody said anything about it. Nobody got offended about that. But some people would get offended about that. Well, you called her a girl. She's a woman. I know she's a woman. She's a girl when I met her, and I kind of fixed that in my mind. And if I saw her today, I'd say, hey, girl, you know, it's just our relationship. You don't have to get offended every time you can find a hook to get offended. Pick your battles. And it's okay to let something slide. You don't have to be a 24-7 warrior. You just don't have to be. You can be. And if it's important to you, then okay. That's the battle you pick. But understand, every time your sister, your brother, your mother, your friend, they know where your buttons are, and every time they push one of them, Thanksgiving Easter dinner is not the time to solve your family problems. <laughs> you can let it slide. If it's important enough that it needs solving, then it'll still be important next Wednesday. You don't need to solve it Easter Sunday at dinner. If it's really important, it will be important Wednesday, and you can call them and resolve it then. It doesn't have to be resolved just because she pokes you at Easter dinner. Just don't take the bait. Be in control of yourself. You don't have to react every time you get poked. And if you're in control of yourself, you can say, no, I'm not. <laughs> thank you, but no thank you. It's so nice when you are in control. I have laughed with people that have jerked me around so bad you wouldn't believe it. And they think I don't know because I'll stand there and laugh with them because that's not a battle I want to pick. When I pick the battle, I will pick the battle. I will pick the battlefield. I will pick the battle time. And I will pick the battle weapons. I'm not going to let them choose all of that by poking me at a party. We may have this battle, but when we do, I will pick it. I will pick the time, the place, the rules, the weapons. I'm going to do all that picking. They don't get to pick all of that. They may stand there and think, he has no idea what I've done. And that's just fine. Like I said, keep your cards close to your vest. They may think, oh, boy, I've pulled one over on him. You know, no, they haven't. And when it comes time for them to know, they'll know. But it's not here at my friend's wedding. That's not the time to do this. We'll deal with this another time.
because I have enough control that I can pick another day, another time, because somebody else's agenda is more important than my own, and I have enough control to do that, and so do you. You just haven't necessarily put that on your to-do list. So that's what I mean when I say clean up your social circle. And you've got people that may sabotage you. And like I said, you can call me a bitch, but you're going to do it long distance. Because you're not going to be in my inner circle if you don't have my best interest at heart. You can go stand over there across the street and throw rocks at me, but you're not going to hit me in the head with one standing behind me. If I know that's who you are, you're going over there. And if you don't, I will. But I'm not going to have people in my social circle that are going to stab me in the back. And neither should you. Now, we talked about cleaning up your habits. The main one is just multitasking. What other habits do you need to put on your list? What do you do that's not in your best interest? Make a list. Check it twice. Ask yourself why you're doing this. What's your payoff? You don't do things in pattern if you don't get a payoff. So I just want you to identify what is it you do that is not in your best interest that you don't want to do anymore. And that's very important for you to identify because I really want you to resolve that you are going to be you on purpose. That's what I said at the top of this conversation. Remember, I started our conversation last time with saying, decide who you are. What's your image? One of the things that defines your self-image is the right to have boundaries. Remember that? That's what I mean when I say you need to be you on purpose. You need to be you on purpose. You need to decide. This is who I am. I choose it. I own it. I purposely execute this. I make no excuses for it. This is the horse I'm riding. Will it evolve? Will it be a better horse tomorrow than it was today? Of course. We're all somebody different today than we were yesterday. But that doesn't mean at the core you don't know who you are. I know who I am. I accept who I am. I star in my own life. You know, Mark Twain said it really well. He said, the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. Isn't that profound? The two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. That's what I mean when I say be you on purpose. Find out why. Figure it out. Claim it. Own it. That's what I meant when I said, be unique, be essential, be relevant. Don't just be. Be unique. Matter where you are. Don't just be furniture. Become meaningful. Be in this world in such a way that if you weren't there, it would matter. I do not want to be in this world in such a way that if I didn't show up, nobody would miss me. I don't want that to be my existence in this world where it's like, I don't show up for seven or eight days and somebody goes, where's, where's Dr. Fian been around for seven or eight days? I didn't even miss him. I want somebody to miss me the minute I'm gone. <laughs> I'll start looking for me right now if I don't show up. Don't you? Don't you want it to be where like, hey, hold on. We can't, no, we can't go without him. <laughs> we need him to be here. It's like, I want to be the pilot on the plane. It's like everybody gets on the plane and says, well, wait a minute, the pilot's not here. We can't go. I want to be essential to this mission. If we're going to fly somewhere, I want to be in the role of the pilot. Like, we can't go without the pilot. Hold on. We can't leave without him. Be essential. Figure yourself out a role, but be who you are on purpose. Mark Twain was right. The day you're born is pretty important or you wouldn't be here. And the other day is the day you find out why, why you were born. Now, remember I said that the secret to success is to know some things that other people don't know. 
It doesn't matter if it's as a parent. It doesn't matter if it's at work. Wherever you are, you need to be essential. I talked to you last week about knowing who you are, knowing what your currency is, and stretching yourself. And that means getting out of your comfort zone. That doesn't mean that it's going to always be a success-only journey. It's not. I'm not telling you that when you stretch yourself, you're not going to fall and skin your knees. Because you're not going to do a face plant. But I'm going to read you a quote from Theodore Roosevelt. You've heard it before. You probably just haven't thought about it for a long time. So I'm not reading you something you haven't read before. But I want us to focus on it. Listen carefully. You've heard it. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who never know victory nor defeat. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. It's not that person that sits back and throws rocks that counts. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. That's where the credit belongs. The man who is in the arena. And by man here, he means human, not male or female. He means human whose face is marred by blood and sweat and dust, who strives valiantly, who comes up short, who does actually strive to do the deeds, the one that gets in there and mixes it up, who in the end knows high achievement, or if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly. He's not talking about somebody sitting on the sideline. He's not talking about somebody in their comfort zone. He's talking about somebody that put it on the line and reached for the next level. And he's not talking about gladiators here. This is a metaphor, right? The arena he's talking about is life. The arena he's talking about is your life. Are you daring greatly? Are you reaching for that next level? Are you modeling for your children? You need to find something in this life that you're passionate about. If your children don't have passion, you need to help them find something that they're passionate about. And to do that, you need to put down those burdens that you're carrying. You need to unburden yourself. You need to give yourself permission to give yourself a break. You've carried these burdens long enough. Give yourself permission to forgive yourself and put those burdens down. I'm quoting people today for some reason, but you know Einstein said it really well. He said, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. That's why I started this by saying I want you to change your thinking. 
We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. You got to think differently. You got to change the way you approach this world. And that's what I'm asking you to do. And I'm asking you to think about this based on how to change what you want versus being a slave to an agenda. Don't be in reactive mode. What I want you to do is focus on what you want. Don't get up and react to the world where you get up and do Monday what you did last Monday just because it's what you did last Monday. Is it what you want to do? And if it's not what you want to do, then start a process of change to get more of what you want to do. Now, I understand if you're working as an accountant and you don't like that, you can't just quit tomorrow and start flying freight out of Africa or something. I get that. I'm not trying to get you to be some kind of exotic dreamer. But I told you, this is not a dress rehearsal. You know what the middle word of life is? If. The middle word in life is if. L-I-F-E. If. You don't want to be on your deathbed saying, what if I had done this? What if I had done that? You want to answer that question. So I want to stimulate your thinking here with a few questions. And you may think these are kind of silly, but bear with me. If you had $100 million tomorrow morning, what would you do different? If you woke up tomorrow and you had $100 million, what would you do different? If you woke up tomorrow and you were king or queen of the forest, if you were just in charge, what would be your top three priorities? If you could erase one thing that happened last year, what would it be? Just one thing. If you could erase one thing that happened in your personal life, I'm not talking about the world. If you could erase one thing in your life, what would it be? If you could ensure that one thing was going to happen, what would that be? So those are four questions I want you to think about. If you had $100 million, what would you do instead? If you were king or queen of the forest, what would be your top three priorities? If you could erase one thing in your life, what would it be? And if you could ensure one thing was going to happen, what would it be? That will get you started on the path. The main thing I want you to do, on top of everything else I've talked about here, and what have I talked about? I've said you need to clean up your thinking. You need to get that noise out of your head. You need to clean up your social circle. Get rid of those toxic people. You need to clean up your habits. Get rid of those things that are not working for you. I've said you need to be you on purpose. Know your currency. Know what you want. So important that you know what you want. It would be so horrible if you spent your whole life trying to become the best accountant in the world only to find out that's not what you wanted. That what you wanted to be was a painter or a welder, or a farmer, but instead you became the best accountant in the world, or you became the best farmer when you wanted to be the best accountant. You need to make sure you're chasing the right thing. The thing I want to put on top of all of it is find your passion. Find that thing that makes you want to get up in the morning, that makes you excited about being alive. What is that thing that makes you want to sleep fast because you want to get up and get back out there? 
find that passion. And if you have it, man, you're so fortunate. And if you don't, that needs to be your quest. What is it you're passionate about? And if it's your vocation, then great. If it's your avocation, that's okay too. If your passion is your job, you're double lucky. If it's what you work to have the money to do when you're not working, then that's okay too. But know what it is. If there's nothing in this life that excites you, nothing that you're passionate about, then you need to find something. There's got to be something in this life that you get excited about. Don't let another month go by that you don't know what that passion is. Well, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I have really enjoyed spending this time with you guys in this series. It's been so enlightening to me. I've had fun preparing it. I've had fun delivering it. I've had great time reading your comments and questions. And I want you to listen to this conversation at least twice. And take notes on this. Don't just type it out. I think it's good to write it out because that puts you in production mode where you write things out. And share this with at least one other person that you care about. But they've got to start at the beginning or a lot of it will fall on deaf ears. I want you to be safe and take care of yourself. God bless.